Uh, as Dave was saying, I'm going to give you a, a real quick blast on about seven things that matter in technology this year and going leaking into, let's say, early 2011. That's kind of the scope we're looking at. This is not a presentation about futurism because that's not the stuff we can act on right now. And it's not about things that are, <coughs> that are necessarily already baked and done. This is about stuff that's emerging in the next six to 18 months, really in the six to 12 window. Uh, and a lot of this comes off the fact that we've just come uh, out of the Consumer Electronics Show, the North American International Auto Show, the GSM Mobile Congress in Barcelona, the Apple announcement about the iPad, of course, there's always something Apple in January, and uh, CTIA, the uh, once great and now a little bit quieter cell phone show just happened in Vegas. But uh, a lot of things happened first quarter that help us kind of set the weather vane for 2010. This is not by any means the last word in technology for this year, but it's definitely the biggest blast comes at the top. So that's kind of where I'm coming from in terms of my agenda. Um, I speak from the point of view of the user very much as a proxy for the users who will adopt certain things and they'll walk away from certain things. Uh, I'm not going to tell you everything here is great. I'm going to show you stuff that's got real issues. Very, very buzzworthy, but has some real challenges. Some of them come from the most famous company in technology right now. And I'm also going to point out to you uh, things that come from sort of the, uh, the, the meta mentality of CNET's editors, because I kind of pick their brains and monitor all their opinions and kind of try and give you the veneer of what a lot of the editors would say, and hopefully give you a little flavor of what they would say if they didn't know you were listening and kind of, you know, following us around the hallway or a fly on the wall, because I, you know, I talk to them and get their frank opinions and try and share those so they don't have to. So it kind of takes the pressure off of them. Let me give you a quick look here at uh, uh, a quick little sizzle piece with it that we did just to show the, the scope of what we're talking about as we kick off this presentation. And then we're going to dive into all these buckets. Uh, you'll see a lot of the most important things, the next big things, as we entitle this, in, in this video here. It's just a couple minutes, and then we'll, we'll dive into the details. And the bad, but if you want to do an inventory on that, you have tablets and readers are one of the next big things. We'll look at some of the pros and cons of those. Uh, also, they talk about 3D TV. As you can see there, it is still a goggle-based technology, which gives us some pause. We're going to talk about in-car technology. That's one that we're counting on very strongly for the year and two ahead to have a real, a real litmus test. A couple of, uh, of years coming up. We've also got the, uh, was it part of CES or anything else, but the Google Nexus One phone, which is uh, being rumored this week as being imminent on Verizon, but of course launched on T-Mobile. We'll talk about that, where it is, and most importantly, what it isn't. Uh, electric cars, I actually dropped out of the presentation because we're so fat on other technology, but if you want to see me about electric cars offline, we can talk about that. Not key to your media work, that's why I took it out. Mobile television, I think, is getting kind of short shrift. I've got a few thoughts on that as we're seeing some new products come out. And uh, we'll also talk about, of course, over the top. That's where we're going to start. Over the top is this idea of delivering TV and movie content without satellite, cable, or over the air. You deliver it over the internet connection, the broadband connection that the consumer already has. Uh, therefore, first of all, offloading the distribution network onto your customer. That's kind of a nice trick, considering broadcasters used to have to spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in their sticks and their frequency allocations. Now let the consumer pay for your transfer. So, it's a lot. But more importantly, it creates all kinds of choice, voice, and control for the user. They can decide what they want, where they want it, how much of it they want, and to some degree, how they want to pay or not if they want to consume advertising instead to get that TV and movie content. It's not about computers and on the web, though. If you haven't experienced a OTT or over-the-top technology, it shows up on a television like this. It's a Netflix interface, it's a Hulu interface, a Voodoo interface, whatever provider. Takes over the whole screen, no keyboard, no mouse, no Windows, no Mac OS, no Linux, none of that. No browser of any kind. It's strictly a full screen television experience. Feels like on demand, but powered by broadband internet because that allows efficiencies and choice you can't do over the traditional structures. Good luck finding a TV by the end of this year that doesn't have it built in. The vast majority will, a significant minority already do, and the cost differential is pretty minor. It'll drop to zero by, I would think, just post-holiday season into 2011. Uh, you've also got the Roku Netflix box, dedicated set-top boxes, 
are an existing example of those that do just that. They bring in internet delivered video. Uh, this has been a very popular device, but still niche. You know, mostly kind of a geek product, a, kind of a large niche, if you will. Look for bigger growth from DVD players that have this technology built in. So they play Blu-ray discs, but they also have a wired or wireless or both internet connection. And again, they have the firmware built in, the software that makes this interface happen. That's part of the magic. And the nice thing about it is, if you've got, you launch a device like this or this, any of these with Netflix built in or any other providers, Cinema Now, you can add new ones just by writing a deal, cutting out an agreement with a new provider, and sending out a software update. So the devices get better and stay fresh as the consumer owns them, keeping them engaged in this new technology revolution. It's not like when you bought your DVD player or your, uh, your last television, and it is what it is. It never changed until it finally wore out, the only change it ever had. This is a product category that can keep evolving with new features, new providers, new content offerings in a way that you didn't have before. So that's really exciting for consumers who are used to that now in computers and smartphones and web services. The other category of getting this, and one we're going to look at here for just a second, are dedicated boxes. This is called the Boxy Box. Boxy is a service that tries to bring all the various online movie and television assets together into a single box with a good interface. You connect to your home entertainment system and kind of harnesses all this internet stuff. Because right now, it's very much a wild west out there. You've got a lot of different providers putting up a smattering of their content. There's no one place to go to get it all. That's not going to be solved right away. But this is probably the best example right now of a device that does it all. Let's take a look at, just very briefly here, uh, what it does and how it works, and also show you the interface as well. Everything from websites like uh, Revision 3, which is a pure play internet media company. You could have uh, Dig up there, which, well, we know Dig. Dig has media to the Dig Nation video show. You could have CNN, you saw them up there. So anything from traditional broadcasters to internet casters to anything in the middle can be put up there and it becomes a new level playing field. So you start to think about media very differently. It's not TV versus internet versus outdoor. It's all just one level playing field of a new kind of channel environment. And every, every website, every web provider is a channel of sorts, just like the networks own a channel on a cable system or a satellite system. So it levels the playing field and it kind of makes it all very legitimate and very unified for what the consumer wants. They don't want to be fiddling around thinking, okay, that's a web thing I want to watch on the TV and this is a cable channel. They just want content. They don't care where it comes from. There's too many sources these days for them to really want to care about that. They have a lot of choices. They want it to just become content differentiated, not platform and pipeline differentiated, which they kind of had to think about in the past. Now, this is the interface of Boxy. I'm only pointing out Boxy because they are one of the strongest in this area, but there are many devices that do this and many more that are coming, and most importantly, many services that do this already, from these guys to Hulu to Sesame. I could go on and on to some that will be here later this year and some that will be long gone. There's at least a dozen. But notice the interface. TV-like, TiVo-like, if you will. No computer feel to it. That's the key thing. I'm not talking about connecting a laptop to your TV and making the YouTube window go to full screen. That's, that's, that's DIY homebrew geek stuff. This is about delivering real 10-foot experience television. It will dramatically change when people watch television, movies, and internet pure play video, elevating that to the same level as all that pro content, as we used to refer to. Now, that will cause some adaptation to take place, and it's already happening. Walmart just bought a company called Voodoo, which was one of the companies that made a box kind of like the Boxy Box. Uh, it had its own TV and movie assets that they licensed from content providers. They put it into a box you could buy. It was at Best Buy for a while. I think the box was like $250. The service was, I don't remember the pricing, a little pricey. It was HD, really nice box. But you know what? It didn't get enough traction. Now, Walmart's going to, uh, as we understand it, bring this box and this service to their price point, much less money, bring down the price per piece of content. Whether you want to rent an episode, watch an episode, uh, whether it's television or movie content, doesn't matter. That's an important step for a company like this, with the kind of eyeballs they have every day, every hour, to be exposed to this, the idea of one of the many over-the-top video providers. Best Buy did a partnership, not an acquisition of Cinema Now, which has been around for a number of years, three or four years now, uh, that is basically the same game. Internet delivery. Uh, their, their game is very movie-oriented, as you can tell by the name. 
But again, you have these major guys who are saying, all right, it's time for this over-the-top thing to break into mainstream, and we'll do what we can to make it understandable and affordable. And that's what both of these brands are all about. Uh, to differing degrees. That's very important. Also, we've got this uh, move a few weeks ago by HBO, HBO Go, which, as you see, the key point is free with your subscription. It isn't free at all. But um, if you have a subscription to HBO, you can now use their online access to some, but not all, of the content. Hundreds of titles of HBO original series here, blockbuster movies, yada, yada. It's not a complete offering, but that will come with comfort among the content rights holders. It's not a technical issue. It's a matter of, all right, put some out there to feel our way through it, not get everybody everything right away just in case we lose our shirt. Now here's one of the most important ones to watch. is Comcast Fancast. This is probably the barometer to keep an eye on right now. And this is Comcast's way of saying, okay, we can't just keep people on cable forever. We're a big internet company. We're playing both sides of the fence. We want them to do this over the top. And we also want to keep them using our cable and video on demand services for all that nice incremental revenue. So what do we do? We allow them to have access to many, but not all of the shows they might get from our licensed content that we pay so much money for every year. On the internet, up to uh, three devices, three computers right now. And we'll open up the devices later. So it's a subset of content. 20,000 shows for 24 of their channels. It's not that big a slice, but it's a start. Uh, you must subscribe right now to both Comcast Cable and their internet. If you have both, you then will have access through a logon and a little program you have to download to your computer to access these 20,000 shows and 24 channels. So they're saying, come in and sign up with us, stay a customer, and we're going to up you to this new over-the-top thing. It's a nice way to keep 20, what, 26 million subs sticking around as opposed to trying out this idea of cutting the cord, as we call it, where people go, you know what? I'll hook up a computer to the TV and go without cable or satellite. It's worth 120 bucks a month to find out if I like it. And if not, I can always go back to cable. They don't want that sampling to happen. They want to keep them in the house. Non-Comcast internet users will get a whack at this later on this year. So right now, you have to have both cable and internet from Comcast. Later on, they will say, all right, just as long as you have Comcast cable, bring your own broadband from whoever, and you can also do this. That's going to be an important additional tier to open it up to. And later on, on a mobile app as well. So you can do this on your smartphone, again, as long as you have at least a Comcast cable account. This should be the big idea for the cable guys. Time Warner and Comcast cooked this up. And it is probably their best shot at being yesterday's cable company and tomorrow's media provider. They've got to bridge both because we're talking about a lot of money moving here. Uh, Comcast and the other cable guys pay over $30 billion a year to license content. Those content creators don't want to disrupt that right away, not overnight. So this is going to be a gradual move, but a sea change uh, without any doubt whatsoever. We're never going back to the days when we didn't have another way, a more uh, granular way to get our content on our television. Let's take a look at this chart. Consumers. Uh, spending on connected home media devices. So buying gadgets and devices and consoles and what have you that can do what I'm talking about. So the first bar we have here is 2009 expenditure in the uh, $100 billion range. And then that goes up to $243 billion by 2012. That's not long from now. Uh, notice a lot of this includes game consoles. Those are already connected over the top media uh, video devices and audio, I should say. But this is really a video thing. Uh, but a lot of people don't use them that way. They have an Xbox. They have a PlayStation, but they don't even use it as a movie or television terminal. They aren't even aware of it yet. So there's an easy way to turn on the adoption by educating consumers and having them get awareness without them having to go buy a new device. Then if you look at the other chart here, it's interesting. It shows the uh, comparison of uh, annual unit sales of connected home media devices. So notice the units versus the dollars. This is where you see the big jump. 32 million units turns into 230 million by 2013. I point this out not to bore you with graphs, but because you see how big this delta gets. That's because of the lowering price of these products as we go forward the next couple of years. Typical tech curve comes out at 600, ends up at 200. So as people spend that increasing money, look how many more devices they get for their money. This will really help power, I think, a massive penetration of these products. And once people have it, they tell someone else about it, and that's where it takes off. That's how TiVo took off. No one understood TiVo except a few early adopters. And then they told someone who told someone who told someone. And now we have the DVR revolution well in place. 
That was a very hard product to get until someone told you about it or you went to their house and you sampled it. When that starts to happen with this over the top stuff, you'll see, I think, a similar adoption curve, which was very, very static. One more chart to you with on this. Um, you might think this is all kind of geek stuff, you know, college kids who would rather not pay the man, you know, the cable company. Well, <laughs> US internet users who would like to connect their TV to the internet, in other words, do this OTT stuff, not browse and email their TV. That, that was years ago, and no one knows that. Um, current numbers over here, yeah, millennials are very high at 74%, Gen X 71%, but boomers, 59%. Show a strong interest in trying that out. Uh, even the matures, 63 to 75 year olds, 46%. For an aggregate number across those demos of 65%, those are real good numbers. Even if their interest is only, you know, baseline. Yeah, I'm interested. Uh, this is really strong. This is strongly or somewhat agree. So this is a really good population, a very encouraging number, and you can see it's been growing nicely in all those categories. So I think we have a lot of reason to believe that this is going to print with users and not become a head scratcher where they've got to work to understand the technology because those we've seen come and we've seen go, this doesn't fit in that latter category, I don't think. Next category, 3D TV, which by the way can also be delivered over the top eventually, not right now, it's just a bandwidth issue. So this was the biggest buzz at CES this year. You couldn't get away from 3D TV, <laughs> you couldn't get away from guys like this old fool with his glasses on because the 3D goggles are one of the first things consumers have to get past. They are intrusive. Television is a very low effort medium to consume, as we all know. That's how most TV is watched, consumed, heard, or seen. Both are important. And to have to gear up to watch TV, I think, is a major hurdle. Our TV guys out in New York, our review team there, this is probably their biggest misgiving, is that the goggles are an impediment to the way we use TV today. Issue number one. Plus, they're kind of pricey. These are not, as you can see, little cardboard glasses with a different colored lens or a piece of plastic in them. These are electronic devices made of hard plastic with some circuitry in them. They're bat battery powered. They have um, active shutter technology in there. You can't really see it working, but it's, it's alternating which of your eyes can see many times a second. And that syncs with a similar frame change on the screen. It's very high-end stuff, and it works really well. The depth is amazing, almost two, two 3D in some cases. But, as a result, they're not cheap. $40 to $100 now, that'll come down, but they're never going to be in $3. These are electronic products. So, when you have eight people over to watch a game, and you own four goggles, now what? <laughs> you guys watch it in 2D? That's not going to work. And it, and it won't look right either. It's not like it'll look fine. It'll look kind of smeary because of the 3D broadcast, and you have your TV in 3D mode. So, there's a big issue with the seamlessness and the amount of friction that will come out of this 3D thing. That said, a 3D TV looks like a regular TV. It's not weird. It's a flat panel LCD or plasma. Uh, it uh, may or may not be really large or a mid-sized TV. None of those are tied to the 3D technology. It's a feature, not a television. That's important to note. So today's 3D TV, and they're coming on the market as we speak, they just hit Best Buy what, about a month ago, is just a really good HD TV with an additional feature set built into it, which is the ability to pull in and display 3D content to be decoded by the goggles. That is a good thing for 3D TV because it means consumers can say, you know what, I'm going to go buy one of these 3D TVs and I know that if it doesn't work out and 3D goes nowhere, all I did was buy one additional feature I didn't want. I didn't go buy some TV that no longer works in a couple of years if 3D goes flop. So that's a, that's a positive for 3D's likely adoption. So I'll, I'll, I'll balance the picture that way. Other negatives, nothing to watch. Uh, you have to shoot something in 3D for it to look good as 3D. That means a very slow buildup of the library. We can't go back in any reasonable way that I've seen yet and redigitize all those old movies and make them great 3D titles. You gotta shoot stuff to spec for 3D. That's just the nature of it. When DVD arrived and when Blu-ray hit, you could go to the vault and create massive amounts of content that's very popular and in the new format and up to snuff. But 3D doesn't really work that way. There are some ways of doing it, but it's not real satisfying as far as we understand. So that means a very slow growth of the catalog. That turns consumers off. It also means the price of media stays artificially high. Not artificially, but stays high longer. Also, uh, a lot of things don't reward 3D. 
Do you really need to watch The Office in 3D? It's no better. Yeah, maybe some scenes. But for the most part, it's no better. It's just the same show, the same storyline with this 3D layer there as a gimmick. So that's another problem. So a lot of things about this say, you know what, it's a better gaming technology than it is a television technology, but Panasonic, Mitsubishi, LG, Samsung, and a few other names you may have heard of would all argue the other way. So let's give them and their enormous amounts of marketing dollars and innovation R&D a chance to prove us wrong. Let's take a look here at the sales of 3D TVs. Again, a pro in favor of the technology. This is Display Search Research. They're kind of the gods of video research out there in terms of panels and things like that. Well, you can see it's a very nice, strong, linear curve of the sales of 3D televisions going up to 2018. But notice that a lot of that is driven by just the natural replacement cycle. When people buy their next TV in 2012, 2013, it's going to be a 3D TV if 3D works at all, if 3D takes off at all, because it'll just be one of the features. If you go out today and buy a TV, it's an HDTV flat panel, right? You can't go and buy a 36-inch CRT. It just is all that's available. So 3D is going to get a natural lift because it's going to be de facto. But don't let that fool you into a usage curve. I don't know the usage curve is anything like this. This is the purchase curve because it's in there. It's like HD radio. How many people here are craving an HD radio? Right, nobody. To speak. But when you buy your next car, it probably have HD radio, and guess what? You became an HD radio consumer, but you didn't ask for it. So this is kind of masking, I think, a lack of appetite till further notice. Let's see. We could be surprised by a 3D revolution. That was the smart uh, This, of course, was one kind of story before the iPod, iPad came out, and then became another story afterward, because Apple just seems to have that effect. This uh, at CES, we saw a new class of not even a new class, kind of a warmed over class of Windows tablet devices, which now are suddenly dramatically overshadowed by Apple. But at the time, they look kind of interesting. The Windows, Microsoft and their PC partners have done tablets before. They didn't go anywhere. They were too horsey, too clunky, too expensive, too involved. They were like $2,000. Didn't wasn't relevant. Uh, they're trying to come back with a thinner thing, but again, Apple is just going to cast this huge shadow over anybody else who tries to get in the space right now. We did see a couple other interesting form factors, shapes. This is from Lenovo. It looks like a laptop, but it's actually a very large smartphone. The keyboard is full size, the screen is full size, uh, but notice that's not really an operating system you'd recognize. Those are applets, apps, as we say today, that are running side by side like a smartphone would do, because that's what this is. It has a cell phone processor, it has a 3G antenna like your smartphone, it just has a bigger keyboard and a bigger screen. It's another way to consider how this whole space might get sliced and diced. People want the web everywhere. Do they want it on a tablet? Or do they value the keyboard? Is the iPhone big enough? Is the Blackberry the right size and format? Because it has a real tactile keyboard on it. We haven't seen that sort out, and that is going to be I think a jury out situation for the rest of this year, probably into early 2011. Another one by Lenovo we saw, that was another way to slice and dice this, is a convertible device here called the, uh, the U1, which is, if you can see the picture here, the display pops out from the laptop, if you will, and becomes a tablet. Let me show you how this looks. Quick video that, uh, uh, that Tom Merritt did on this one also, just to show you how, how it works. And you know, I don't know that it's the last word in this kind of thing but it's another part of the thinking that is very, very busy right now in the industry. Hey, I'm Tom Hart here at CES. One of the iPads going to have, which is no keyboard, no easel device. They're going to have a keyboard easel accessory, but not one you carry with you. So it becomes a flat or held product that has only touchscreen. Uh, that's a very narrow approach. Apple's con uh, comfortable with narrow. Though. They've, they've done narrow very well many times. For them, less is more. They've sold a phone, or for a long time, they sold a, a smartphone that did less and sold more. So, not an argument. But uh, there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of a lot of people out there thinking about this idea of the laptop's too onerous, the smartphone is too restrictive. Where do we find the middle ground? That's what's powering all this. If you're wondering, why is there a new category of devices? Are they just out there making it to try and sell another set of devices? Well, partly, yes. But also because consumers do want more room to run as they become more web, web tethered in their life. As it's harder to go without the web and web services, they want to have a good way to get to them all the time, not just a, a subsistence way, which is a little more what a smartphone 
is like and feels like going forward. Now, the e-readers, of course, have been and continue to be a very big deal. This is the, uh, the skiff. This is the uh, entourage, uh, this is, which has two screens. Kind of hard to see here. You've got a grayscale reading screen on the left, and you've got a color web browser on the right, and an access tablet. We've also got devices like the um, Plastic Logic Q, which is more of a professional device in the $60 to $800 range. It opens up all Office document formats, as well as uh, PDF and EPUB. You've also got uh, this one here from um, from uh, oh boy, Spring. This is called the Alex from Spring Design. And this one has, again, a grayscale reader at the top, a color uh, web terminal at the bottom. Again, these are not computers, but they have some access built in with a color interface because that's how the web works. You're not going to browse the web on a grayscale screen, not for long. Of course, compare this to the Kindle, uh, which doesn't have anything like that. So it becomes uh, kind of a moment for Amazon to start deciding if they want to become something different or stay true and narrow to this concept of a reader. Well, these other companies here, some of them are saying, well, the reader should have more in it because that's how consumers are. They do a lot of different stuff in the same modality. That brings us to the Kindle. Uh, you know, the current model is the, uh, the Kindle 2. The DX is not a big consumer device. It's not become a, a product that rewrites the Kindle's fortune. So concentrate on the current Kindle. We know what it is. It's a uh, six and a half inch or a six inch screen, E8, grayscale technology, web access to a fair amount of content, but again, no color screen, no true browser that you'd ever recognize. And of course, they have 90% of the electronic book market share right now in terms of sales of books. But that's largely a function of being out there early, especially with you know who comes along. So we have just announced the Kindle iPad app. Let's see how well the iPad works as a reader. It doesn't have a grayscale e-ink screen. It has a color LCD. And that may or may not be acceptable for in-depth reading, which the Kindle is very good at. And the competitors that use a similar screen, like the Sony Reader and the others, the Barnes & Noble Nook, for example. So the issue is, can the iPad become a really great reader? We'll talk about iPad functions a little later. I got a, uh, a few slides on that alone, just to decide what is that thing going to be used for. But Amazon is also rumored to be looking at a significant price cut on this device. And of course, the app here on the iPad will mirror the fact they have an app on the iPhone. So they get it. They know where, the, where that momentum is. But can a standalone reader stay relevant, I think, is a pretty fair question. Uh, if you can get a device that will do a lot more, maybe not as perfectly. If the iPad is a good reading device, but you know, it introduces a little bit of eye strain, but it's not awful, but you get all that other stuff that it'll do, that may be a very tough time for these readers to stay very narrow and very focused and ask us to carry a device with its own, and its own charger and its own case and its own uh, need to download things to itself. All of that, in addition to all of the other devices that we're carrying these days. And again, it's not a big media play either for you guys. Now, here is a discussion of mobile TV that I want to have with, uh, with you for a moment. This is getting, I think, relatively little coverage compared to what it could be. This is a device from LG. It's a $250 portable DVD player that also has TV. That is a mock-up of a television signal coming in. It looks really good. It's a real product. This uh, is picking up digital television off of local broadcast signals. It's mobile digital TV, the thing we converted to under the federal mandate. Finally. It is optimized for mobile use, which we never had before. Anybody here have a Sony Watchman back in the day? Didn't work, did it? No. Snowy, fuzzy, zigzag lines, all that, because that was analog TV and it was never built to be used moving, let alone even tilting, let alone moving. This is a version of DTV that has been rolled out. It just got put to bed as a spec back in December, so that's when the products came out in January finally. That is suitable for reception. Rock solid, totally clear digital TV perfection up to 60, 70 miles an hour. So it's automotive friendly, as well as certainly handheld and walking and cycling, whatever you might want to do with it. No, please don't. Please don't <laughs> run a bike watching TV. No, that's not going to work. That's the free version. So that's picking up local free television. Contrast that with, and this is an iPhone version of the same thing. Contrast that with this, which is Flow Television. It's a uh, company called Flow International, a division of Qualcomm, uh, kind of spun off last year into its own thing. This is a also a little portable TV. Picks up cable channels, not broadcast channels. You can see you've got MTV here. Here's NBC, Nickelodeon. They've got MSNBC, CNBC, CNN. Um, TNT is on one version. 
This is a technology that has just cable channels optimized for broadcast over cellular towers and provided by wireless carriers who pass the signal through their infrastructure. But there's a fee here, uh, $9 a month after you pay $250 for the device itself. And as you can see, it's about a three inch screen, just right for handheld viewing, that's it. It doesn't have any more resolution than that. You're not gonna hook it up to your big screen to watch there. It doesn't have enough <laughs> signal coming in. It just isn't made for that. It's just what it is, a portable TV. And could also be used in the car. It's sufficient for headrest use. This is not this exact device, but the guts of it could easily become a headrest TV. And again, it's made for being picked up on the move. This is a different model entirely than the other guy. Free versus $9 a month. The hardware costs about the same. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said here for consumers who are tired of the DVDs in the back seat because the kids have seen them all, they don't know what else to put in the car, they forget to get some fresh discs, now the kids are bored as you go driving. That whole DVD disc idea is just really, really kludgy. This could create a much more uh, realistic entertainment environment for families in particular in vehicles. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot. I think there's one car maker who is preparing to offer this as an option. I forget which one it is. Chrysler. Chrysler. Thank you. So I don't think anyone else has been talking about offering it in vehicles yet. So that's, um, to me, an opportunity. It's not complicated. It's the, there's no integration to the vehicle systems. There's no internet thing going on. It's just design the thing, plug it into the vehicle, power it up, and it works. That's why I like it. It speaks to a lot of consumers. And the most important part is it can really help turn all those vehicles out there that are on the road every day into a lot more television viewing locations, which traditionally they have not been. They've been radio locations for the most part and are, I guess, outdoor locations. But this could be a very big deal for television in the car. Uh, I think it's not getting enough coverage. But we'll see if perhaps the smartphone and the smart devices are what have taken the attention that it would have been. <coughs> Let's get a look here at uh, the disconnected car idea while we're in the vehicle. Uh, of course, we're all familiar, I'm sure, especially here in, in uh, the Detroit metro, with what's been going on with Ford's latest announcements of sync. With, uh, and they had kind of a multi-headed announcement at CES. I was talking to some of the people today who handled that, and it was like, wow, you guys had a lot of, you had a lot rolled in there. It was a little difficult for, you know, especially the lay press and the mainstream consumer to understand. So I'll break it down for you. Number one, a new interface, this screen, and these two helper screens up here, this is what they call my Ford Touch. It's a new way to get your eyes and hands on the car. So that's number one. Number two, mobile application. That's what these icons represent. Pandora, Stitcher, a Twitter helper whose name I forget right now. Um, apps that you can use in the car, just like you have on your smartphone. Uh, the other part of this was internet access. You see I'm showing you a Ford in dash web browser right there. And the other part of this is offering the, um, the ability to bring in a, an SD card that you have in your camera that has a navigation program on it. So navigation becomes an app, not an option, not a $2,000 thing you have to option when you buy the car or forever go without it unless you want a Garmin, which is fine. But it becomes something you can add later via a chip. And that's a very cool way to kind of make this more digestible for consumers. So a lot of things are going on here with what's called My Ford Touch with Sync Mobile Apps. But this is where the, all the car companies have to go. They have to start realizing that their cars are mobile personalized devices with the need for internet connectivity. Now what Ford does here, what I think most of them will do and need to do, is they tether, they connect your smartphone to the car, just like you do with your Bluetooth system. You connect it once and it stays connected whenever you get in the car. That's where this gets its internet connection. Ford is not offering an internet program. Ford is not offering you a monthly data plan. Ford is not putting internet wireless technology in their car in that sense. They're just saying, connect your smartphone. We'll let the smartphone become the pipeline that brings the internet in. So we don't have to deal with that. And the other thing that they're doing, which is very clever, and I think very, uh, very savvy, is that they are having the app live on the smartphone, like your smartphone already does. You go download apps to your Blackberry, your iPhone, what have you, it lives on the smartphone. All they're doing is, is, um, is, is echoing the interface, the screen, onto that middle screen of the dashboard in a way that is automotive friendly. It's actually deceptively simple what they're doing. There is no app being loaded on the car, no software being installed on your vehicle when you put Pandora on the dashboard. It's just being echoed or displayed on the dash, controlled by the dash, but all the works are still happening on the smartphone. 
That's good because that keeps the car maker out of the business of having to keep up with the innovation cycle of web applications, which is wicked fast. They don't want to be in that game. They just want to be in the game of porting and integrating into the car, but not at a real techie level. So that's very smart. A lot to be said for this. Again, streaming radio is coming after radio. Just like I showed you mobile TV is coming after broadcast radio one way, streaming radio is coming after broadcast radio the other way. Not necessarily a great scene for the radio broadcaster, although radio has a very durable, long-lived uh, presence in the car, so it's not going to be knocked off overnight. But amazing new pressures could be coming against the broadcast radio um, audience and appetite as we see these things enter the vehicle. Of course, it's also an opportunity for radio for those that are strong and savvy about being an internet station, not just a local city. This is something that's being done by General Motors that was very impressive. This is OnStar Mobile, so it's going to come out with the Chevy Volt, but eventually be available on several of their vehicles going down the road, I imagine most of them, uh, a few years' time. Uh, but it's being shown with the Volt first because it really fits with the technology message there. And it's, uh, it's a smartphone app that does a lot of remote control, although I hate to use that phrase, that sounds a little Jetsons-y, but a lot of remote control and access to the vehicle. Let's just take a look here. It's a little hard to explain without seeing this, um, this short video, but this will show you what it does. And it works really well, I have to say. Hey folks, Brian Cooley here at CES 2010. Thank you for that in their own life. Would you like to be able to connect to your car and just check its status? Hands. Anyone think that's cool? Okay, good. So pretty... I'm not it, right. it has that also. Good point. Good point. We had to cut it out of the video for revenue, but it actually is also a locator, which is, I hear that all the time. Where did I park the car? You know, it's that, that lot, that lot, I come back from a trip at the end, at the airport, it's like, no idea. No idea where I put that. So that, and they could add any number of functions very easily because it's just software that you push out to the phone, push out to the car over the internet, easy to adapt, easy to keep consumers engaged with the automaker. Uh, whether there's a an idea of standing in the middle of a revenue stream between the, uh, the car owner and their vehicle or not is almost a beside the point. I think the idea here is for the vehicle maker to stay relevant to the <laughs> car owner through the life of the vehicle to, at the very least, keep them in the loop for future purchases, to make them more conquest proof. Very important, whether or not, and certainly a lot of them will, you're also offering value-added services, either from a third party or directly from the car maker. That's another area, of beautiful revenue there perhaps, but this is about keeping loyalty and defending against conquest. I think it's very, it's very strong. Uh, consumers will eat this up. Why? Because the smartphone opens the door. The smartphone creates the appetite. You have to explain to consumers, would you like to have all your smartphone apps easily usable and accessible when you're on the road? Of course. Would you like to be able to access your cars like you access other things in your life on your smartphone? It's gettable now. Couldn't have done this four years ago. It would have just been right over most consumers' heads. Like, what? Hmm? I, don't know. I don't know. Show it to me. Maybe I get it. Eh, I don't know. Now it's very clear. We've had a big change in people's ideas of mobile access and power and command and control than we had even a few years ago. Let's take a peek here now at the iPad. Fine. Now, uh, as you know, it's uh, just about to ship this weekend. They've been taking pre-orders. They've had uh, apparently pretty good uptake. For whatever reason, they're now saying that any current and future pre-orders up to launch day are going to be delayed in about a week or nine days. Not bad. I think mean, there's not a problem we know of, but maybe they got ahead of demand a little bit. So it's about to debut. There'll be a flurry of reviews, ours included, of course. It will be uh, posted very shortly as we get some real hands-on time with this thing and really put it through its pace, which is a big question. What are people going to do with the iPad, or worse, what are they not going to do? Is this going to be the next iPhone, or is it going to be the next Apple TV? Somewhere in there or somewhere in the middle is a big question mark. Maybe a complete game changer, or it may be, as Steve Jobs now describes Apple TV, a hobby for the company. Uh, he would prefer the former, as you can imagine. The um, the iPad is going to be probably largely about the apps more than the device itself. Uh, we have well, we have some idea what consumers will do with a connected web tablet. That's not a mystery. But I think there's a lot to be understood about what they will do differently with this than the iPhone or an iPod Touch or a netbook slash notebook computer. This is uh, some research we picked up just, uh, just a few days ago about likely 
usage as intenders who are going to buy one of these things, or most likely are, think they'll use their iPad. As you can imagine, the web is number one. About 50% of them say they'll do that. This is not percentage of how they'll use it, by the way. It's percentage of folks who say they will use it this way. We don't know the pie chart of intended usage. It wouldn't make any sense now anyway. People haven't had a device in their hands. Close behind that is email in the high 40% range of responders. Then comes music. I'm a little mystified by that. Um, that, to me, is a consumer saying they're going to leave their iPod at home. But if it's your iPhone you've been using for a music player, okay, you're going to switch to this? It seems like a kind of horsey device as a music player. So that was a little odd. Books, of course, are a big story. This is about selling both the device and book revenue for iTunes. This is a really major go or no-go point for Apple that I know they'll be watching as closely as I will. Contact surprises me. I, I don't need a bigger or more expensive contact manager, but apparently some folks do. Some 38% of them. Uh, video player, obviously, great big screen, connected device. Uh, some of them will be anyway, 3G. Well, they'll all be Wi-Fi at least. Oh, by the way, the Wi-Fi model is what comes out this uh, Easter weekend coming up. The 3G one comes out later. Photo viewer, that's a natural, great screen to look at photos. Easy to download photos to it, transfer to it, all that. So that one's not even one to scratch your head over. Periodicals, same thing. Periodicals make sense to me, especially because they reward color and they are not an in-depth 200-page reading experience. You're not going to, you know, this is sort of sit there and spend an hour and a half reading intensively a periodical. It's more of a jumping around, browsing, short reading, you know, uh, maybe a thousand words at a go. So that really seems like a, like a winner. Calendar, yeah, calendar's going to be in any device these days. Light gaming, this would be fun games. Things like word puzzles, things that are not action shooters, anything out of that category. Apps is the big sort of, mm, that's the bucket, app, what, what, what apps? This is the one we have to watch because if the apps that are dedicated to the iPad, that are invented, developed for it, that don't already exist uh, on the iPhone and the iPod touch base are really killer. They take advantage of its size, shape, touch screen. Uh, if those are really compelling, the iPad gets a big lift. If it's just a bunch of iPhone, and iPod Touch apps that are twice as big, that's not that compelling. And this device will scale those apps to fill the screen. So what? I don't necessarily get all that much more value out of an app that's twice as big. Uh, I need something that, that, that's really different that says, my function only makes sense if you've got a bigger screen. I don't know what those apps are, to be honest. We're so used to doing everything on a small screen. We read maps, we do navigation, we do everything on a small screen. Uh, we've kind of become used to it. Now we're going to be allowed to breathe a little bit. Let's see what the developers can do with that real estate. And finally, the least popular category, it's still in the low 20% range, are folks who say they're going to play action games, more intensive games, shooters and, 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 and things like that. So wide array of intentions here. This is about behavior. That's the iPad battle. Not is the device engineered right. That's you know more or less a given. That said, it's missing a bunch of parts. No GPS. It has assisted GPS, but not real GPS. No camera. That's a little odd for a device that would be a great video conferencing tool. Although I suspect AT&T probably you know, said, uh, no, we're not going to have another way to tax our pitiful network. Um, <laughs> Also missing um, flash, of course, just like the iPod Touch and the iPhone. That is not rectified in the iPad, and I think it's more egregious in the iPad because it is such a potentially rich web device, and I'm going to get that little broken icon that says, can't play flash. That's really going to scream broken to me, even more so than it does on the smaller brethren. So those are at least three things right there that say, you know, and just speaking personally, don't buy the first generation hardware. Please wait. Uh, wait till August or maybe end of the year when there should be another generation. I don't know anything, I'm just saying. Uh, there should be something else further down the road. Let's take a look here at um, app and app advertising revenue. This is global. This is according to Gartner as of January. I know these, these estimates vary, but they're all within a range. So this is just a sample. Let's get some idea out of that. Uh, they're showing 2010 revenue from app sales, the blue bar. $6.2 uh, billion, dollars, up to $21.6 billion in 2013. It's a big jump. That's, uh, that, that makes app revenue a bigger industry than radio. Bigger than radio in the United States. 
uh, all that already a revenue combined. So that's that, that's a real business that puts it up there in the world of gaming. And then app advertising revenue, smaller of course, but similarly spiking, going from virtually not even a number worth looking at right now, uh, up to $5.4 billion in app ad revenue by 2013. So this is a significant uh, a significant market, and one that I think, uh, I think Gartner's got a pretty good hand on. I don't think anybody would argue this in principle. It's, it's definitely a place where people are engaged. It's a place where they've expressed preferences about their current behavior when they're in the app, what they're doing, we know. We know why they're there. Apps are very focused. Apps aren't like a web browser which you can do anything in the web browser. You can go to this site, that site, this, that, the other. Uh, an app is about a certain function and a certain modality of your mind at that moment. So it seems to me to be a very fertile place to target advertising, to really get a good uh, snapshot and catch a person in a moment when they're open to whatever that message, uh, whether it's uh, organic or conquesting, whatever that message may be. Also on the app front here, uh, let's take a look at the so the difference, the very broad difference between the various smartphone platforms and the apps they've got. Apple's on the left. Uh, blue is June 09, red is March 2010. You can just look at the red, that's all that really matters. There's just no comparison to how many apps exist for the iPhone, iPod Touch, and by extension the iPad compared to the other guys. I mean, Android is the next biggest base at 30,000 versus 170,000 on the Apple side. There's a lot to be said for that because software tends to tends to be lumpy that way. Developers go where the mass is. That's why that's the Windows versus Mac thing in terms of both software titles available, at least historically and to this day. It also explains why Windows gets far more uh, viruses and malware because hackers aren't stupid. They want to go where the market is, if you will. The market for them, which is victims. Um, Blackberry and Palm, uh, very, very low numbers compared to the other guys here. And Android is growing very quickly, as you can see. That's a huge jump on the Android platform. And a lot of this is because of how you develop and because of the, uh, the restrictions or the, uh, the approval process, and you know about that. But this is, uh, this is a very important thing to watch because I think the apps are part of what makes smartphones, tablets, smart devices uh, really go or not go in the market. And you need to know this because each of these platforms that we're looking at here is a different environment in terms of how and through who you may place media. Not in every case, but in some cases. So it's important to watch this horse race in terms of not just who's hot, but uh, also who's on top. All right, now it's Apple, but you gotta watch Android. Um, you know, Palm, you can pretty much forget about. Google. <laughs> Love Palm, but they're killing me. Um, the Google phone, the Nexus One, formally speaking. Uh, new rumors, in case you heard them afresh today, that it's imminent on Verizon. Rumors, don't know. But uh, the phone itself is not really that big a story. It got all kinds of press, largely because of mainstream press that just fell for the Google phone and just ran it. It's not that interesting a device. It's a good device, but it's not that different from other Android phones that are out there. It's really about the model by which and through which it's being offered. Let's take a look here. Uh, our phone guru, Kent German, uh, filed a report from CES which is not where the phone was announced. It was announced at another event up at the Google campus in Mountain View, but um, at the exact same time. It gives us a little overview here. Hi, I'm Ken Chairman, senior editor here at CNN.com. I'm here at CS20. It really marks how differently this phone is being sold than most phones are sold in this country. So it doesn't have that many groundbreaking features. It's really just how that phone is sold, which I think is the most important about it. Now, Kent and I have talked since then, we talked about it a week ago, and it's, and it's, kind, of, it's kind of an odd sell. The unlocked thing, you all know what that means. It means that the phone is not tied to the carrier. You can decide, you know what, I'm going to go activate it under the carrier, and that's it. It's, it's my business, which is not how most phones are these days. They're locked to the carrier uh, that you bought it from, and supposedly shouldn't or won't work on another carrier. The, um, the reality is most consumers are not really that savvy about that and are strangely okay with being tied to a carrier. They've best been so beaten down with that idea over 20 years. <laughs> they just stop caring. Uh, it's always been that way. It seems as though there's a long education process to get consumers that fired up over the unlocked phone. So that's part of what's going to, uh, if not hinder, at least not uh, accelerate the adoption of the Google phone and the other Android phones like it. Does anyone here have an Android phone? Anyone here an Android phone user? All right, so a few people. 
That's about representative market share. Um, the issue here is that Google is competing with their own people. <laughs> they worked hard to get carriers and handset makers to both make these phones and offer them and get them certified on their network and all that labor that goes into it and to get developers to develop. And then they went out there and said, oh, by the way, we're going to compete with you as well. It would be as if Microsoft went into the PC business back in 84 when all those PC companies were first getting their sea legs. And then here comes Microsoft with a vastly bigger brand, even then, coming along and offering basically the same product. It's a very odd strategy. On the other hand, realize that I don't think Google's in this for the long haul. They're not going to carpet bag and run out of town, but they don't want to be in the phone business. They aren't doing this for that reason. They're doing it to, to put through the changes that you see Kent talking about. Unlocked phones. Wide open device. Any app, bring it on in, let's make it run. Uh, a whole lot of openness that they'd like to see happen because they want every device anywhere to access any of their services unfetteredly. That works fine now. In the future, they want to make sure it stays that way. Being a player like this is part of why they're doing it. Same reason that Google's getting into the, uh, the broadband business, as you may have heard in the last couple of weeks, they want to mega wire a few cities around the US. It's incredibly fast broadband that we've never seen before. They don't want to be in the broadband business for long. They don't want to be Comcast on that. They just want to get out there and force the agenda, get it going their way, but it's all about their services and the ads that come with them being universally and more readily acceptable or uh, 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 gettable by any consumer out there who wants to get them, including, and most importantly, vast amounts of high-definition video. Now, the, uh, the Google phone, of course, does have um, like I say, a lot of lookalikes that are just like it. So I wouldn't get too concerned about who makes what Android device. The key is to watch the Android operating system and see how well it does. And as, as you can see on the apps alone, it's doing well. Let's take a look at the actual market share of the operating system. Here is uh, some recent numbers. There are some recent numbers on smartphone platform market share. This is US, by the way. Number one, this may surprise some folks, this is smartphones only, is RIM, not the iPhone. RIM is far and away the market share leader in terms of smartphones deployed today at uh, a slightly declining 41.6%. Significantly below that is Apple. Trending up a little bit, but at 25%. That's a big difference. That is largely because RIM offers a bunch of different phones. There are many Blackberries. They offer them in every carrier, unlike just AT&T. They offer them for a lower price, vastly lower in many cases. Lots of pricing promotions, which Apple doesn't play. Uh, all these things, plus the fact that everyone gets BlackBerry, and it's not off-putting. People who are not very tech savvy say, okay, BlackBerry, I get it. It's an email on the keyboard. Simple. The iPhone, to some people, seems like too much. I don't need that. I don't need that newfangled thing that's so incredible. Anymore. It's almost like the hype is too good around the iPhone. and scares off folks who can't rationalize the price or don't think that they're that tech savvy which is a big, broad piece of the market. Anyway, these two guys are killer. Um, we've also got uh, Microsoft's market share here is, uh, you know, it's okay, it's not bad. It's, uh, it's, we'll talk about Windows on, on phones in just a second, a couple slides down the road. And then of course, here's Palm trending down disturbingly, and uh, Google low, but trending up the most of anybody on a percentage basis. So this is a very different picture than you might think if you just kind of keep one ear on the smartphone race. You think it's an iPhone world and everyone else kind of falls in behind Apple. It is not, which is good. It keeps Apple honest. And it's about time they have a real serious competitor in some market they enter, which isn't always the case. Uh, let me take a look here at one, a uh, couple other things I want to show. This is global market share for smartphones, by the way. Notice a new name enters when you get into this one. We get Symbi way out in front. Think Nokia, basically. Uh, Symbian and Nokia are very symbiotic. And then we get RIM after that. Look at the difference. And of course, after that, we get to Apple. So Apple's playing third in the global market, second in the US. But look at the mind share they command in terms of getting us in this room to think about media differently, getting consumers to think about media differently. They are the catalyst, even if they aren't the biggest dog in the room, sometimes by a significant margin. And then, of course, after that, we have a lot of other players. The Windows platform, Linux, and Android together. There's a little put your glasses on, you can see it. And um, you know, a bunch of others that are out there, not a bunch, but a few others. So you can see how it's becoming a very, it's becoming a very clear picture as we go forward. Uh, RIM, Apple, Windows, Android, and then Symbian if you look at the global picture. 
I want to give you a quick talk, uh, talk here about Windows Phone 7. This is the latest and possibly the last best hope for the Windows platform to do well on, on smartphones, which it's never been celebrated. We have a lot of Windows phones out there. How many folks here are carrying a Windows-based smartphone right now? One, can I even get two? No. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the story of Microsoft. They've got a lot of, um, and I will, I will give you my Blackberry to get you off that. Is that what it takes? Okay. Um, it's just never been a home run. It does deploy in some fairly good numbers, as you've seen in the charts, because of Microsoft's mass behind it. And it has always done a pretty good job of integrating, an okay job of integrating with Office and Outlet and Exchange and all of that. But this is some of the new look that they just rolled out at Barcelona at the Mobile World Congress of what the new Windows phone will look like. Completely different from your Windows phone. I mean, that's just night and day different. The menuing is different, the interface is different, it's big, it's bold, it's, um, it's, it's easily digested as an interface in terms of your eye and getting your hands on these touch devices. Uh, it looks more like a Zoom than it does any other phone on the market, which is intentional. They're using a sort of a, an extended panel, I don't know what they call this, but it's a pane that is virtual. So you would, you would flip your finger back and forth and you would explore a window that is larger than the device itself, as opposed to flipping it on its side and going landscape, you would just move back and forth on the device, and it also goes on its side. But this is sort of a virtual large screen, as opposed to making a bigger device. We'll see how it goes. It's not totally revolutionary, but their, their take on it looks really good to us on first blush. We've not had in, these, in detail time on this product yet. It's not, not to that point. This is a social networking mode. That's what they call it, people. Pictures, obviously, both online and on device. Very important, especially when you've got a good size screen. Music and video, this is the Zoom DNA being brought into the operating system. So they're kind of trying to congeal all their camps together. Which also brings us to games, which would be their Xbox DNA, and it will tie in to Xbox Live and have a lot of commonality, at least as much as you can on this device, with the Xbox gaming world. And also, kind of their other big kingdom, which is Office, be able to read and modestly edit and handle the Office document types. So this is a, an important, uh, kind of a final effort by Microsoft to become relevant, seriously relevant, in smartphones. They've just been kind of on the fringe there, kind of a large fringe player. Um, and Windows Phone 7 is their new name, by the way. That's, so when you hear that, that's what this means. They're trying to congeal it all into one place. So that's the next big thing stuff. Now the questions. Who wants to ask what? Yes, sir. Um, is Nokia doing anything different than yeah. what BlackBerry or Apple does from a global standpoint. As, as you start seeing automotive companies going global as the trend is going, do you see anything big that they're doing that is taking over the market globally? Hmm. And the question was, is Nokia doing anything different fundamentally than, uh, than RIM or Apple uh, globally? Because you saw the Symbian market share is very high. I should say that Symbian market share, you know, the definition of smartphone will vary by certain research. I believe that research was Gartner, and Gartner, I think, qualifies as a smartphone, anything that has a keyboard and a, uh, what do they call it, a detectable or distinguishable operating system. That brings in a lot of what we call feature phones that are not truly on the same platform as your BlackBerry or your iPhone. Hence, those numbers look really big. It's a little bit of a broad gilded. Uh, Nokia has never had big traction well, really anywhere in terms of having great smartphones. They do great phones and great feature phones. They have been fighting to become a real relevant player in the smartphones. They have several good ones that we're always impressed by, in the U.S. market at least, which I know we're mostly focused on here. Uh, they don't get carrier support. The deals aren't there. So consumers walk by. They're not going to go pay $700 to buy a Nokia smartphone. As good as they are, they have some great ones. They've had some fabulous ones over the years. The, uh, the 9000, the E71, I forget all the alphabet soup, but they have some great devices. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you don't get to a point where consumers can even consider the product. That's what's been holding them back. Yes, back here. Well, yeah, Bill, yeah, Bill Gates at one time said that uh, the biggest study he has on his R&D is visual voice and handwriting recognition. And I just don't seem to see that really <laughs> Where's that investment going? Technology <laughs> seems to be coming. Because for me, I would love to not touch a keyboard. I'd love a computer to know who I am. And, I would love to sit there and just talk and you know, not have to deal with the keyboard and the mouse. 
Yeah, uh, the question was if uh, Bill Gates has said his biggest R&D line item has or is, has been at Microsoft Visual and Voice Recognition. Um, where is that? That's one of the big issues, especially in the automotive integration of smart devices. You can't be fiddling, touching and looking at it. They've got to get voice recognition, text to speech, and speech to text. So you talk to it, it talks to you. Way better. Uh, Ford and Honda do it the best in our opinion right now, and not nearly well. It's still a stilted conversation. Uh, I don't want to understand what the car wants to hear. That's not my problem. The car needs to understand what I say, regardless of who I am, and without any training, to be honest. It needs to be really good. Computers can do it. They just don't have that kind of horsepower in the car yet in terms of doing voice rap. So that is a, that's the first I've heard of that. I, I don't doubt it. Uh, why it's not showing up well in Microsoft products. Yeah, he said his goal was visual voice and handwriting recognition. Yeah. Right end game. Well, I'll put it this way. Right end game. Right end game. Absolutely because that opens up a lot of additional use cases for a lot of products, both in car, in hand. I mean, you, you, walking around using your smartphone, you tend to have to stop on the sidewalk and do anything that requires any concentration. That discussion you have with the device is, is still very Star Trek. It doesn't really work like it did on the bridge of the Enterprise. And they promised us that like two years ago. So um, someone's not really delivering. Follow he, he also just he also said that it, was, it, was, it would be very powerful for the third world to be uneducated. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so a quick couple notes on the third world, you know, the question I had here. Um, you know, the, um, by 2013, the uh, projection is, well, I don't know if you made that projection. It's one of the uh, one of incredible uh, research houses. <coughs> Expects that the smartphone will be the dominant internet access device by 2013, outstripping personal computers. 1.83 billion versus 1.73 billion. That's a very different era going forward, and much of that is, is developing world. And by 2015, it'll be the most popularly used, the smartphone will be, internet access device. So they, they lead by units in 2013 and lead by amount of access in 2015. So boxcars, back to back. Just think how powerful that is. If you have any doubt that smartphones are a big part of internet access and the access to interactive media in general going forward, well, the computers are about to become a little broken. And the smartphone will be what you think of when I say the internet. Today you think of a computer on your desk, more than likely, or a laptop. You see that classic iconic image. If you go to a stock photo library and type in internet computer, what comes up? A whole bunch of desktop computer photos. A few years from now, I mean very few, it'll be a lot of photos of smartphones. That's what the stock photo, if you will, of an internet access device will be. And for the developing world, it's often the only device they have. It's a family computer, it's the shared device, it is how they get to the web, and there may not be anything else for millions of people, not so much in the developed world, but in the developing world, that is going to be the modality if you want to think bigger and broader about that sort of thing. Those are questions. Yes. Um, my question is about advertising in the over-the-top devices. Mm -hmm. Does the advertising, will it follow it to those devices? Or? Okay, advertising over the top. Uh, it varies. Tip, the typical model now is um, like Hulu, for example. Whole different ad, ad load, uh, often sold to a single sponsor, though not necessarily. Um, let's say 30 minute show, which is only 22 minutes, three 30 second units are in there and they're sold to that distribution. They're not part of the broadcast ad load. As far as I know, it's seldom tied. They'd be happy to, I'm sure, but it's just a different advertising uh, construction for OTT right now. Uh, look at Netflix. That's different because you're paying for that with your Netflix account. So if you have that little Roku box I showed you, you hook it up to your TV, it's 99 bucks, one-time fee, no, no rental charges, nothing like that, and you just get the stuff because you have a Netflix account. There's no advertising. It's just a gimme. These models are all under consideration, though. If anything gets too popular, guess what? The, the rights holders are going to say, no, let's turn on some advertising. It's, it's gotten too popular. They'll float it for a while, and then it's like, good, it's got some traction. Now let's go play the advertising game around it because we want to get more value out of this chain. But right now we're seeing, I think, a deceptively low level of advertising. Uh, that's just because of wanting to float things and get the, uh, get the appetite. <coughs> but no, it's, uh, to answer your question, it's either no or different advertising. The other area I would comment on is the mobile televisions. So the one that is over the air, yes, everything goes through, full pass through over the air. That's the free one on the right that has no fees. The Flow TV I showed you, the one on the left, uh, that one has, 
actually know this. I don't know if it carries over the cable. I don't think it carries over the cable advertising. I don't know what they do during spot breaks, so I'm afraid I don't know that off the top of my head. But there's a fee involved there, so it wouldn't surprise me if they are doing some kind of content substitution during spot breaks and not carrying over the cable, the cable insertions. But I'm not sure. Either. Have you just a follow-up oh, question? Yeah. Have you guys done any studies on um, how much people will accept advertising depending on how much they paid to subscribe to that content or the box or whatever? Yeah, we haven't done any studies on whether or not people will. You know, where's that point? Will I pay four ninety nine and a few ads? Nine ninety nine. I want no ads. That's the big question right now for a lot of the stuff that I've shown is um, I just stepped on the cable and I made that happen. So <laughs> don't feel that. Um, so, I got this little tech magnetic field around me. I tend to break things without <laughs> even touching. Um, so the, 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 that question is one of the big ones to be figured out. There is no, there's no, there's no answer to that that doesn't come with a few years of experience because the consumers don't know yet themselves until they try it and live with it for a while. And that's part of what will keep a lot of this, uh, a lot of the content held back a little bit because no one's going to open the floodgates of the vaults of all the content until the model's established and people feel like, okay, that's our new revenue model, we can start letting go of this one. This is the big issue right now is people who control advertising have to protect their client and make sure that they aren't running off after the next big thing and leaving behind the big proven thing. That's always been the issue with interactive media in many of its early stages. You know, the web we get, uh, email advertising we get, a lot of stuff we get. This stuff that I'm showing you, a lot of this, it's the next frontier. So lots of trial has to happen. Lots of trial. Uh, there was one over here. Yes. Where do you see uh, tablets as a whole category going? Um, is that are they going to replace netbooks uh, by and large? I mean, and will people carry that as a separate device? Because Right now, it seems like when well, you got a smartphone, you got internet access on that, obviously with some limitations of size. And, yeah. But then if I want something more robust, well, I can pull up my laptop. Yeah. Do I really need a third in-between device? That's, that's one of the issues that Apple will, will be out in front proving because they'll get so many more units sold than any other one identifiable product. So the nice thing about Apple as a test case is they put out one model, more or less. You know, different memory, that doesn't make a difference. And they put it out there, it's very focused. It's not a whole array of models like Blackberries. The iPhone went out there and it was just it's one model at a time. And that lets us look at it and say, okay, taking all those other noisy factors out that Apple doesn't introduce, how is it being used and what is it replacing? What's your gut? My gut is, I don't have a real strong conviction on that, but I do think that's one of the challenges for the iPad, is what am I going to replace? I'm not going to carry three devices now. I've already got a smartphone and a notebook. I've got a portable media player, iPod, whatever you may carry. That's pretty common. Now when I put in a fourth device, uh, which of those do I replace? It's not a notebook. It doesn't run programs, it runs apps. So that's not the same thing. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a keyboard. That's not the same thing. It's also not going to replace my iPhone. It's not a phone. It doesn't logically clear the decks of anything. So it says you're carrying another large device that doesn't fit in the pocket. Got a big problem with that. Big problem with that. But we've seen, you know, how many people would have told you that they would, you know, there's people today that don't carry a cell phone because they, you know, that's it's too bulky for them. They want things smaller than a matchbook, I guess. But we had to convince people to carry notebook computers. That was weird for a long time. A lot of folks carry notebooks now. A lot of folks carry cell phones and even smartphones. People said, no, nah, too bulky, I'm not gonna carry that big gun thing. That's I don't like my little skinny phone. Well, no one does that anymore. The little flip phones are gone. No one cares about those anymore. So we've seen consumers embrace more, but I have never seen consumers embrace this much more. That's a lot of paper. Yes? I think, uh, the tap devices, especially in the home entertainment sector. The question is, why did it take so long for this over-the-top video delivery to gain traction? It's been around forever. And one of the reasons it's called over-the-top, one of the reasons, uh, in case you wonder where that phrase came from, we didn't make it up. It's the new industry term as of kind of last summer, last June because internet TV and IP TV got ruined by previous horsey efforts that just didn't work. There was, remember the media center PCs? You were supposed to put a computer in your living room and hook it up to your television and sit there with a Microsoft branded keyboard and a, a, a remember the Windows remote? Uh, no one did it. No one did it. It just, it was too, it was too computer and there weren't enough content providers embracing it and offering web-based delivery. There weren't enough uh, uh, 
uh, Hulus and TV.coms. There weren't enough Roku, Netflix type services on the set-top side. There wasn't Xbox Live like we have now for the Xbox platform, and on and on and on. So it took a lot of content to be out there, which, didn't, which wasn't around a few years ago. And it also took a device that didn't say computer, because computers are noisy, they're big, they're ugly, and they also say work. And people don't want to introduce that into their living room. So this has been a combination of services and devices that just had to naturally evolve. I don't know which came first. I don't recall who was the chicken and who was the egg, but we definitely had a confluence of the devices and the content, and to be honest, the, 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 the bandwidth. We're now at an average broadband speed in American homes of 3.9 megabits. I think it's the most recent number. You probably have like a five or a six in your home today. If you're really into the net, you might have a 10 megabit connection. But that was, that was a much smaller number a few years ago, and not quite sufficient to stream television and do anything else in reality. So all those three factors just, just happened. So yeah, one over one here, more, I think. One more. One more question? What do we have? Yes, right there. Okay. So obviously in the technology, you've got entertainment, you've got communication and connectivity, everything's coming into the car. But we're also seeing a ton of distracted driving and legislation. Mm -hmm. Do how are manufacturers reacting and do consumers care? Okay, the distracted driving question is a big one. All this stuff coming in navigation, entertainment, communication, social network updates coming into the car, all of this is possible, doable, and coming in greater numbers. The, had, had this not been a big year for the health care bill, uh, seriously, that might have been one of the biggest stories going on right now. It'll happen later, but we're, uh, we were, we've been hearing rumblings for a while of the first federal distracted driving legislation, which has usually been a state thing. That's how big the discussion has gotten. It's going to be a major issue this year, later on this year, the distracted driving question at state and federal levels. Um, that's where we're going to see the car makers have to innovate at all times to avoid distraction, and that gets us back, in large measure, to text-to-speech and speech-to-text. That solves a lot of issues. Well, it ameliorates a lot of issues. It doesn't solve any of them, because if your mind is engaged on something else, I don't care if you have fingers, eyes, or voice on it, you're not fully focusing on the road. As a society, we have to decide that's okay. It's literally that simple. It's not even a technology issue. But look for that to be, you know, one of the big issues in automotive technology this year and next to the point where it's going to be a rallying cry for politicians. It's going to have all kinds of groups around it. And it's going to have legislative action, I think, at the, at the federal level for the first time. But honestly, we're not going back. Uh, we're just not going back. I'm sure, although I have no evidence of this, I'm sure the same thing was said about, the, about car radios when they first appeared in the 30s, I think, late 30s as a factory integrated product. That must have been seen as crazy, crazy talk. You know, you know. <laughs> there's, that, there's that voice coming out the dashboard again. You know? <laughs> look at the little numbers you got to look at when you turn that knob. That takes your eyes off the road. So that had to be, you know, somewhat similar, but really there's no comparison in terms of the, the amount of distraction you can get today versus any other time in the vehicle. Um, the key here is are we okay with a little more distraction in exchange for a lot more? What? Productivity? Convenience? It's, it's honestly a very selfish a balance to strike, but the consumer market will demand that. So, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.